wanted to do today is talk a little bit about the way that World War I um, affected the art world and the arts. And I'm going to present to you a series of paintings, mostly, uh, by artists that you may know or may not know. Some of them are very iconic of the World War I art experience. Others uh, should be. And uh, I think that one thing to remember about this topic is that World War I was really very critical and crucial to the development of modern art especially, and the arts in general in Europe and the United States. Uh, in many ways, they're not so obvious. Right? And uh, when you think about World War I paintings, what would you think would be in a World War I painting? Yeah. A painting of yeah. World War I. But one thing to remember about painting and, and um, the context in which painting takes place is that uh, sometimes uh, the context can affect painting without re being reflected in the actual content of the painting. In other words, the paintings can change in different ways beyond what they depict, what we imagine they depict. And I will try and bring this point home to you that World War I not only produced many paintings that depicted World War I, death, soldiers, the front, and so on, but also because World War I changed society, it changed the way that painters reacted to their environment, and they changed their paintings in other ways as well. So I'm going to show you both of these changes. Uh, also, if you have a question, you may ask at any time or make a comment upon the paintings that I show. I'd be happy to interrupt and ask as we go along. You don't necessarily have to wait until the end. Yes? Well, was the impact because it was so huge? Is that why? Great question, because it segues into exactly what I was going to talk about next. Right? <laughs> so maybe you can just talk amongst yourselves and I'll be <laughs> <laughs> you might already know what I'm going to say. Uh, yes, the first thing to remember about this war, which may have been touched upon last week, is that the First World War was the first mass war, uh, in that millions and millions of people participated in the actual war itself, in combat, and then they went home afterward if they were still alive. But also entire societies were mobilized, so people at the home front as well were affected by the war. And of course, people who lose loved ones are affected by the war. People whose jobs changed, industries changed. Basically, everybody who lived in the combatant societies, whether they were at the front or at home, their, their way, the war changed everything for millions of people. Before this time, most wars were far away, with a few exceptions that we don't have to get into because we don't have time and I don't really want to talk about them. Uh, but uh, for our purposes, for the people that we're talking about, this is the first mass war. Uh, and even for people who were thousands of miles away from the front, they could be affected by it in some ways that were uh, obvious or not so obvious. Uh, the other thing to remember about the First World War, and especially generally about war and culture, is that we had this mythology that built up in the, after the war. Uh, in which enthusiasm for war turned to dis disillusionment at the front line. Right? Many of you have seen films uh, uh, or read books like All Quiet on the Western Front, which you should read if you haven't read or see the various film versions. You know, that's sort of one of the literary works that has shaped our view of the war and what it all was about. Uh, and uh, if you think about that presentation of what the war was for, what it was all about, the answer really after it was, it was pointless, <laughs> right? And war is bad. And so finally, one of the things that this war experience fed into is that it really deepened uh, cynicism and doubt about not just warfare in general, Right? when ideas of heroism and glory in the 1920s and the 1930s just didn't make sense for people anymore as they did in the 19th century. But also a general cynicism and doubt about traditional conventions of uh, non-warfare related things like politics and culture and society 
that fed into some, uh, many people argue, some of the worst aspects of the 20s and 30s in uh, fascism and communism and uh, things like that. Uh, but on a slightly brighter note, uh, modernism in the arts and culture, uh, as I'll talk about today, were greatly affected by this, uh, well, disillusionment that took place right, with conventional society and culture. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how these general broad things were reflected in painting, and by art I mean painting, uh, and also as we go along, not only may you ask me questions, but you can also reflect about whether these things that I just said actually seem true, and to what degree the various points make sense, uh, because it might not necessarily be uh, so. Any questions? Great. Uh, before I get to actually some examples, I'll talk a little bit about some of the general trends that people have pointed out related to this topic, right? Uh, by the way, this is my book that you can find on Amazon. If you want to buy it, I'll get like a dollar for each copy. <laughs> it's hardly even worth mentioning in that case. But if you all buy one, then I'll get like $80, that would be good. <laughs> so buy one. <laughs> Uh, one of the first, the first thing to remember that many people remark, literary critics especially, is that World War I really introduced uh, ir uh, irony and cynicism into high culture and popular culture during the war. The people, the artists and poets and literary figures experienced the war and they went back home after and they rejected modern warfare, modern life, and all of the things that up until the war had, uh, well, had got them into that horrible situation. And this was particularly pointed out by the literary critic Paul Fussell in his book, Great War and Modern Memory, in which he argued that to many of the poets and the writers, and by extension, the artists of the time, uh, all those romantic um, ideas, and the, especially in Great Britain, the pastor pastoral tradition uh, and poetic conventions really could not stand up against the realities of the First World War. That is, poets who had been writing about sheep and country villages went to the war and they got blown away and they thought, well, you know, this is real life. And writing about cherubs and, you know, love and um, pre-war life just didn't make any sense anymore. Uh, he also argues that the First World War really introduced uh, irony. Irony became the dominant theme of uh, modern culture during and after World War uh, I. Uh, and although irony had existed as a literary convention, obviously, for many thousands of years, you know, a very long time, it's not that irony was created in the war experience, but that so many people viewed irony somehow <coughs> as very important after going through World War I at the front and at home. Right? And maybe you can reflect a little bit on why that means, but irony is a situation in which the reader or the viewer knows more about a character situation than the actual character. In other words, we have more power and we understand more uh, about what's going on than the actual characters do. Uh, so that's the first thing to remember that irony becomes a dominant, possibly a dominant trope or a dominant theme within literature and painting. Maybe it does, I don't know. The second thing that's more obvious, I mean, he was, Fussell was writing about British poets and not about German painters. So maybe he didn't cover everything. Oops, didn't want to do that. Uh, the second thing, question. Uh, is this the same Fussell that uh, is a literary critic for Faulkner? For what? Faulkner, William Faulkner. Uh, I will say yes. -S 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 I don't actually know. <laughs> I don't actually know the answer to that, but uh, he's an American scholar of American literature, so okay. I think the answer is yes. Yeah. But I don't know. Somebody Google it. Actually, done that. <laughs> uh, the second thing, which I am uh, going to probably emphasize more, is that World War One created for people, people who are visual artists, right, a certain mm -hmm. problem of realism. What is realism? 
What is important? How do you reflect what is going on around you? Can it be depicted? So it raised artistic questions about what the hell are we doing as painters, right? trying to reflect a reality. Should we try to reflect reality? Can you tell the truth about war? Can people handle the truth? What is the truth? You can see that people who are thinking about these questions are going to change their view about many things that they had accepted before as true, possibly, if you question the foundations of how you know things. Right? So many, many artists felt the urge to tell the truth about the war to other people whatever that was. Uh, also, in other cases, there was public pressure that pushed artists to depict certain things in certain ways, right? To reflect more traditional styles. And for many observers at the time, war uh, was a time that would lead to a cultural renaissance, right? A sobering up of the nation. Uh, a cleansing of perceived unhealthful elements within culture and in society, right? That whether those elements are foreign, right, or modernist, or sinful, or you know whatever they happen to be, people thought when you go to war, this is serious, right? And we're going to get rid of. We need to mobilize our society, get rid of everything unhelpful. It will raise the standards and the quality of our people. So therefore, painting should reflect those higher standards or different standards of some kind. Uh, and now speaking very more specifically, what that meant directly is that many artists left some of the abstract styles that they had adopted before the war and began to paint differently, right? Paint in a more realist style, whatever that is. Uh, the third thing that you might think about the problem of war and art is that depictions of violence and depictions of war increase, but maybe not as much as you think. But it's logical to assume that artists who go to war become interested in depicting that. If millions of more people have the experience of war, the odds are that more artists are going to be painting war or trying to paint war in some way. Right? So it was pretty rare, actually, for artists to paint, to paint combat or to paint war before the war. Uh, before World War I, uh, war art was uh, a certain genre uh, of uh, ac academic painting in 19th century Europe that was uh, really not very popular, except, except among princes and aristocrats and states. Uh, but during the war and after the war, many artists who had been soldiers started painting war right, in, more, uh, in less um, formalistic terms. Right? There was just more war to depict. So they did. Some used it to shock audiences, violence. Uh, others used it to tell the truth about the war to other people. And maybe others also just liked the war or missed it and wanted to reflect that in um, painting or in literature. There's actually not too many paintings after the war that valorize war. There's a lot more examples in literature to find people extolling the virtues of war in poetry and in novels. Uh, the fourth thing that I want to mention, and I'm going to move a little bit faster, is that uh, the war also changed the behavior of artists in society, uh, partly for some of the reasons that I've uh, already suggested. That is, if, there, if the structure of the art market changes and people want more realistic paintings, what will artists do? they will paint more realistic paintings to sell more paintings, right? So if the art market changes, artists are going to change. And let's say newspapers are interested in public or magazines interested in publishing uh, paintings about the war. Who is going to rise and create more paintings about the war to publish in magazines? Artists are going to change because the nature of the market changes, right? Uh, 
so basically what I'm saying is that artists are not immune to the uh, society that they live in and the art culture that they live in, and if demand changes, they're going to respond. Artists don't usually write paint paintings just to keep in their garage. Uh, they want to sell it to people, or they want to put it out in the public. And they are going to meet the demand as the demand changes. Um, so, now, these trends, uh, the fifth thing and the final thing that I'm going to mention is one thing that happened during the war is that there was a blurring of the division between high art and mass culture or between art and artifact. When you think about it, what's the difference between art and artifact? That's kind of a rhetorical question, but you can answer it. Well, artifact it. is sort of a remembrance of something, like an <coughs> equipment you found from something, or a piece of something that was part of it, and an art is something you create, maybe for beauty, or... Right, so an artifact is something that's created for what? It's not really created for it, but it's used in history, maybe. You know, well, but you create artifacts all the time, <coughs> you just find what's an artifact. Well, like if I find a photograph of World War One, that's an artifact. Right. Or if I find a diary, somebody wrote very well. Or what about a, uh, a bowl? A bowl could be an artifact of World War One if it had looked like it was a Right, but what is an artifact created for? Utilitarian. You, yes, to use in some way, oh. right? And what is art created for? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a lot of different reasons. <laughs> and, uh, usually, art is created uh, to go into a gallery and to make the artist money to supply some demand. But what we define as art is different than an artifact, even though they actually are the same root and they mean something that is made. So, uh, so the, blue, the difference between art and artifact blurred a little bit, and the difference between art and posters and magazine illustrations blurred, right? Because when we think of art, we think, when you go to the Crocker, where do you go? To a museum, and you see paintings on the wall, right? So that's different than reading a magazine and seeing a picture, of, uh, an illustration or a photograph in a magazine, right? But both of them are created. And both of them are visual culture, and they share a lot of things. But because of the situation that they're in, they seem different to us, and they are different. But during World War I, many of those boundaries began to get a little bit squiggly, and as I'll explain. So this is all to um, just give you some background as I go through some paintings, and we can see how some of these things are working, and forget about the ones that don't make sense. So uh, I think that uh, these trends are um, things that generally are true, not true in all cases, just some things that I want to show how the war experience can change and shape the way that art is produced and uh, understood. Uh, and uh, I'll just start with this, right? Pablo Picasso. Everybody knows Pablo Picasso, right? And one thing to remember, I'm going to choose Pablo Picasso to illustrate maybe a couple things. Right? I'm using him to illustrate how French art was affected, uh, French avant-garde art was affected by World War I, even though Pablo Picasso is not French, Spanish. But uh, he lived in France, and as a foreigner in France, and, and one of the premier uh, leading avant-garde painters of our time, and of all time, his experience, you know, uh, illustrates many important things. One thing that I will say is that uh, World War I in France was crucial in push, pr uh, pushing, excuse me, the French avant-garde to collude with conservative ideas both during and after the war. When we think about the avant-garde, we think of people who are radical, painters, both, we tend to think that painters who are in the avant-garde Cubists and whatnot are radical socialists, radical anarchists. Pablo Picasso himself was a communist. Uh, yet during the war, many of these painters began to publish 
and produce patriotic images. Right? Some of them because they went to the war, went to the war. Others because they were criticized in the press for being suspect. Right? And uh, a, uh, I didn't supply a bibliography, but there's a book by Ken Silver called Esprit de Corps that argues that basically the right wing in France during uh, World War I uh, pushed the avant-garde to change the way that they depicted both their art and the content of what they depicted, right? And that this conservative view emphasized that France was a nation as a collective, modern art was suspicious, it was foreign, and that artists should reflect something that was French, right? Patriotic and conservative. Cubism especially, which you may have heard about, in France was accused of being a German art by art critics. So, you know, imagine you're an artist, you're doing Cubism, people say, what you're doing is German and not patriotic. How are your sales going to be? <laughs> the police might show up. Well, they did. Ask what you're doing. Now, anybody who knows anything about art, or even you people who know nothing about art, if, you, if I say that cubism is German art, you're right to laugh because that's absurd and silly. And what did the Germans say about cubism, by the way? It was French, it was French art. <laughs> <laughs> and they were right. <laughs> And they, they were writer than the French who were saying that the Cubism is German art. Because there actually were too many Cubists in Germany. Uh, anyway, what was I talking about? <laughs> Picasso. Picasso and the pre So many in the Parisian avant-garde, uh, some of them were drafted, right? Many of them uh, changed their art and their style. Uh, Picasso uh, was a foreigner. Uh, and as I mentioned, and he uh, was from a neutral country, so he didn't actually go to the front. But he, uh, but he, his art changed as well during the war, probably, and I shouldn't say probably, as a response to many of these things that I've mentioned. Uh, especially being a non-French, non-combatant in, and fairly famous at the time, right, <coughs> uh, put him in a very difficult position, right? Why aren't you at the front? Tommy, anarchist, and uh, you find therefore a lot of ambivalence in his wartime work. He did not reject cubism, but a lot of things changed and he added a lot of things to his repertoire. Right? So just for example, I have this uh, painting called Vive la France from 1915 during the war. And if you look at this, it looks kind of like a very collage thing that Picasso would do. You know, but what do you see in the painting? Flags, French, there's a vase right here. It's like a vase to me, I'm not quite sure. Vive la France, vive la, well actually it doesn't say France, but it's got the flags here. And uh, you can ask yourself, was this meant to be ironic? Was this random? Actually, no, these painters did not put, it looks like they put random stuff in their paintings, but nothing they really put in there is ever random. Probably, it, this was not meant to be ironic, if you understand the position of Picasso, uh, that uh, we know the nationalistic atmosphere of France at the time, and we know that Picasso did not always feel comfortable in his situation in France, and it's hard to think that he would antagonize his hosts by being consciously ironic, right? But he did add that little bit of patriotism, if it is patriotism, to his, uh, to this work, anyway. Uh, Something a little bit more obvious is this, right? One thing that Picasso also did during the war is that he changed his style to become, uh, well, much, uh, to return to a pre-war, Latinate, uh, neoclassical series of things. And he began to paint paintings of Italian peasants and harlequins and bathers, right? So this is a painting of a harlequin of 1917 uh, uh, in which he, uh, his cubism is, my, is, oh, there's, is this cubist? No. Not really very cubist, right? In which he's abandoned a lot of the cubist tropes to pursue a much more, and if you look at some of the other paintings that I did not show, they are much more uh, classical, right? You might say, Ita much more Italian, looking like from the Renaissance. 
Uh, so uh, his style here has become more conservative, and what, what is the content has nothing to do with World War I, right? The style has changed to become more conservative. Uh, did he want to sell art in the conservative market? Did the war make him think about stability and eternal values? I have no idea. <laughs> the main thing is that the style changed. And it fits the trend with many other painters as well. Uh, which I'm not going to have, I'm not going to show. But I have some other examples. Many other painters, Mark Chagall, Vasily Kandinsky, people you may have heard about, they changed their style during the war to a more realist style, less abstract style. Probably because they wanted to uh, communicate with a different audience that was not the avant-garde audience. Uh, the second example I want to take is Max Beckman's Resurrection, which actually is, um, Max Beckman was a German expressionism, expressionist, excuse me, uh, who before the war became notorious, as the other German expressionists were, for critiquing middle class German, especially urban society through their paintings. And the thing about it, we call it expressionism because it expresses emotion, right? And in Max Beckmann's pre-war paintings, you find anger, you find frustration at modern society. Uh, they contort the human form, right? Mm -hmm. They use unorthodox colors, the expressions do. They focus on the urban experience and how disjointed it is and uncertain it is. All hallmarks of modern painting. Uh, they have many unflattering portrayals of middle class people, which I'm not showing. <laughs> you just have to take my word for it. Uh, and when, but when Beck, Beckman was, did go to the front, unlike Picasso, he, he was enthusiastic. And he actually went to Eastern Prussia to fight the Russians in September of 1914, at the very beginning, in which he wrote, I am happy and hope to experience a lot. <laughs> and he did experience a lot. He had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> he was evacuated back to Germany. He was in hospital for a long time. And the war experience became a crucial moment in his life. Obviously. Uh, it spurred a shift in his work from drawing that used tone and color to show contours to a technique that emphasized sharp line and greater detail, and in this case, a different narrative. And this is, this is a huge painting that's in, in uh, Stuff's Gallery in Stuttgart, I believe. Uh, I could not find a picture of it, because uh, they don't allow a picture of it on the internet. You have to actually go and see it. I did get, this is, there's a video in which I was able to get a screenshot of some German guy, excuse me, a German art critic getting a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not Beckham. <laughs> if you understand German, you can Google it. He'll have some very interesting things to say about this uh, painting. But I, you can, I can see a little bit of it anyway from where I am. Um, the thing about this painting, which is called Resurrection, is that it was started, he started during the war in 1918, uh, and he never finished it <laughs> uh, until 1933. And it's also a huge painting. Part of the reason for this was I wanted to give you some scale uh, by showing man in front of it, right? It takes up a whole wall of the gallery, and uh, most people who paint paintings of this type don't paint paintings like this, because who's going to buy a painting like this for their living room? <laughs> you are. <laughs> you need a lot of money to buy this painting. I, I disagree yeah. with your premise that painters paint paintings in order to sell them. They may do some, but I think the original impetus to do it is to express what's in them. I'm actually saying that right now, because he is not painting this painting for a market. He is painting this painting for himself, right? Exactly. Because you, if you painted a painting for a market, you would not paint this painting. It's too big. You can't move it. It can't be taken apart, right? How do you move it? They had trouble moving it, so they don't move. They don't let this painting go out of German, out of this room, on like traveling exhibitions, because they they don't love it because they can't. Hmm. So, 
as you say, he wanted to do something else. And I didn't say R is only paying for the market, just many of them do. And they all paint for different reasons. He also painted other things, right? But he painted this for himself, presumably. Uh, and it was a turning point in his career and in which he became, it's difficult to see from this picture, much more realist, right? Much more realist. Uh, and much more concerned with real form and telling a narrative story, and in this case, much more detailed in its brushwork than his previous works, and much more attention to shading and to perspective. Right? And perhaps more important, what this means, right? I don't know if somebody had their hand up here, but what do you think the, you can't really see this, but by the, uh, by the title, Resurrection, right? He is speaking of himself. Right? and how he is trying to process and get through and understand this war experience that he had and what it means for him uh, in, his, in his life. Uh, so this is, sort of, this is his view of humans resurrecting themselves after the war, but also of himself being resurrected. And being resurrected is not easy. There's all sorts of pain right, in this painting. Jesus was resurrected and like, wow, I feel a lot better. <laughs> it's actual dying on the cross that hurts. But for him, for him, it's the resurrection that's, the, that's painful and not easy. And if you're working on a painting about yourself called resurrection, you take how many years is that? 15 years and still not quite finish it. You've got some issues to work through. Uh, and, and what this painting is not about, it's not about a redemption, right, of war. It's not about absolution. It's not about forgiveness. It's about survival and how painful it is for the survivors, right, who are left. And it's a monumental work which shows you how concerned he was with this issue. Um, and not really necessarily a, crit a critique of the war, right? It's not, it's not a criticism of the war. It's just an honest confrontation with a painter and his experience and his wish to tell that to other people. I could have shown you some things, uh, pictures by Otto Dix, right, which you've all seen, that are much more critical of the war and make fun of the war. I choose a different one about that. But for, for Germany, I'm going to choose, I choose this one to show that there, is pe there are people who are working things out in art Right about what they experienced and how that war experience changed them. Yes, uh, and they're kind of themes that they're dealing with. Did like, Beckman leave any biographical information about this particular painting, either expressed to his biographers or when uh, talking with a critic? Or I think he did. Yes. Anything that yes. that you could research on that. I think you could research that. <laughs> well, I could. I, I could I'm also just do asking it. if there is any. <laughs> if there is any. One could. I'm not sure how much of it is translated in English, but there probably is some. He's a fairly famous uh, uh -huh. painter, so I would imagine that uh, some of that has been done in English. And in Germany, he's very, he's very well known, right? And uh, so there's been lots of critical uh, commentary on him. Yes. Uh, the, you know, the, the dates are the, the dates that he actually worked on from 1918 to the Yes, he started doing those what, sketches. What did he do with this painting during the time the Nazis were? Well, this is, uh, well, you can imagine, what did the Nazis think of this painting? Uh, it would have been, it would have been, yes. did he was, was, he, he uh, I think he fled, actually. But his, his work was condemned as degenerate art mm -hmm. in 1933. Mm. Which is why he stopped working on it. <laughs> Do you know if it was part of that degenerate art yeah. exhibit? That I don't know if it was particular. I would doubt that this one would be because it's so big. But other paintings by Beckman were in that. I'm concerned about where it was stored or if it was stored away during that time. I don't know. I don't know anything. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Research. I don't know anything about that. But other Beck, some of Beckman, I believe, was at that uh, trip, that exhibition that you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Small yeah. Painting. I think so. And the pre-war stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Beckman not. Kosher. <laughs> well, for Nazis. 
Yes. When did the United States declare war on Germany? When did they begin? 1917. 1917? Yes. Mm. I'm not going to talk about the United States. Well, maybe I will briefly. Uh, so for, for this artist, working out the war experience and changing uh, and still remaining an expressionist, but changing the narrative and changing his style was very important to working through the war. Uh, other artists were doing much, changed their style much more radically. And I'll use Russia for this example. <laughs> Kazimir Malevich. He was one of the most famous pre, uh, of Russian avant-garde painters now, for reasons that I'll get to in a minute. He has become very famous in recent years as one of the most important innovators in modern art and modern culture, not for this, for something else. And he's of Polish extraction, but he lived uh, and worked in, uh, in Russia proper. He went through various phases of Impressionism and Expressionism and Cubism and Futurism before World War I. But during, it was during World War I that he radically re-envisioned the relationship between the artist and art and physical reality. And uh, he called this style suprematism. <laughs> for reasons that I will not talk about. <laughs> uh, maybe at the end, if we have time. <laughs> Which he invented with his friends, I don't want to give him all the credit, he had some associates, in 1915. That's not what this is. We know that the war weighed heavily on Malevich's mind, because he did do some other things, right? He created a, a series of post propaganda posters, <clears throat> and this is an example. Uh, so is this a, this is not a, this is a, something you could find on, on a poster or a postcard that was sold on the street in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and various cities in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, in which basically Malevich, who is part of a very small honor guard, is now trying to participate in the anti-German propaganda effort, in this case, anti-Austrian. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at this poster, what do you see? Mm -hmm. Who is in the poster? Hi. Not Heidi, <laughs> Natasha. <laughs> a Russian peasant woman is spiking an Austrian soldier, who's also the enemy, uh, on a, it looks like a pitchfork. Uh, and if you look at his writings and his diaries and things, which I actually have, uh, you'll find that violence and destruction uh, are full of He's just very interested in this and very impacted by it, right? And if you read his uh, notes and his manifestos and his lectures, you'll find apocalyptic notes and atmosphere within them. Uh, but from this poster, you could, you, all you tell is that he is supporting the war efforts. And something important to him may be selling for, uh, you know, make a few dollars or rubles. Actually, probably not really. It was Kopex, this is the case. So here's what he wrote in 1916. I'm not gloomy that I'm going, he was drafted, by the way, but he uh, was not sent to the front because they considered him unreliable for some reason. Okay. Uh, it was interesting. I'm not gloomy that I'm going, also anarchist. I am not gloomy that I'm going to war to fertilize a few square yards of earth. Gloomier is that a quick end is not foreseen nor what kind of peace will be, or how many years it will take to see again that life that existed on fields of art before the war. Right. So two years after this, he's already become quite uh, disillusioned and fearful. In 1916, he writes, war has already been gone for a long time. Now there is horror. A nightmare has pierced through all common sense. That what is happening now is not war, it is a madness of the human mind. The mind, having gone mad, pulls itself from the skull and flees into the earth. So this is somebody who's thinking about war, and by this time, not happy thoughts. Right? And the result of that is this, the black square. Which I put on that cover, remember? Sale by Amazon.com. For $35. Or 30 
Um, Black Square 1915, one of the uh, most, well now, one of the most famous, you guys will look at this and go, huh, ah, we've seen that before. But in 1915, they had not seen this before. And actually in 1915, not very many people saw this either. Right? But this is where a lot of, well, what we call, this is where non-objective art is created. And I would argue as a response to the war. And I'll explain what non-objective art is, maybe in a minute. Malevich, so what is this? What is this? Not a trick question. No. What is it? OK, yes, it's painting, so it's got oil on canvas. Right? But what is it depicting? It doesn't depict anything. It is a black square. <laughs> Actually, this is very interesting because he painted over a previous painting that he had made, which would indicate what? Changing his money. Lack of money, lack of, can lack of supplies, right? Lack of canvas, so you just reuse it, right? In the war, there was often, people often didn't have access to oils anymore or canvas, they had to reuse things. But he did a lot more that weren't, they were just black squares, you know? Uh, this is what it is. It's just a black square. Right? It doesn't represent anything. It's just itself. And he called this, this is what non-objective non art is. It's something that doesn't represent anything outside itself. It's some, if I said that this painting represented a Russian peasant, then what would it do? Represent something else. You might not know how, but the painter himself said, this doesn't represent anything. It just is. It is, it is something I have created and that I have complete control over as the artist. I have the power to create, right? The real reality. They argue that this was realism. This was the real realism, right? Because what is this? For somebody like Malevich, what's wrong with calling this real? It's a representation of something that's probably not real. Right? It's an idea. Maybe that person doesn't even exist. Probably there was a model, but I don't know. He could have just thought it up. It's not a real person. It's not a real time. Right? I mean, it looks realistic. It's fig in, in art critical talk. It's figurative. But Malevich said it's not real. And the artist who created this is not recreating anything real by pretending that art is something else than what it is. Just paint on canvas. So you destroy something in order to make it. He doesn't say that's not real either because it's not a black square. Well, it is. Well, but it's... Don't resist. <laughs> <laughs> Are those little They're cracks in the paint. They're just old. They're cracked. Yeah. It's just cracks in the paint. It's very old. But it's cracked because there's paint underneath. They did x-ray of it and they could see that they just painted over something. But he did some other paintings that were just brand new and that are black squares without the cracking. Yeah. Yes. When did that crack? In 1915, 1925? I don't know. So it wasn't... In he didn't do it as intentional. No, it's not intentional. Right. It's just age. Where was he painting at that time? In Petersburg in, or in uh, Moscow? He's in Moscow. Okay. Did it represent death? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he argued that this doesn't re this doesn't represent anything. <laughs> in fact, I think he argues this is the true realism. And what does this not if this doesn't represent death? What does it represent? Not death. <laughs> not war. In fact, not, well, at that time, not revolution. Why anarchy? He's just saying, actually, this is the only way that you can paint during the war without painting the war. Right? Why? There's no war in here. The, the artist can control it and just say, I have painted a black square. It is peaceful, it is geometrical, it is structured. In fact, he argued during the war, cubism was violent, right? Because what does cubism do? 
It distorts and rips apart and is angular, right? But this is geometric. It's pure. It is made of pure colors. Right? It is the antidote to chaos. Right? And this was directly, he directly linked this to the chaos and the violence war by saying, this is not that. And the artist has the power and the capability to create and sense a world. This is a world, but this is an artifact without war. In addition to all the other things I mentioned. Except he wouldn't have done it if there hadn't been a war. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Nobody knows what would have happened if there hadn't been a war. He might have done it anyway, but his language would not would have been different. Right? And he would not have talked about the war. That's one thing you have to remember, is that if there's a war going on, people tend to relate their experiences to it, whether, the, uh, whether they're actually related or not. So I don't know what would have happened without the war. Maybe this would have happened anyway. But he would have talked about it differently, obviously, because if there's no war going around, he would not have referred to a war that was not happening and, and saying that this was an end to do the war. I'm totally unfamiliar with that artist. Does that, act, does that canvas actually exist someplace? Yes, it's in the Tretikov Gallery in Moscow, in the very back. Has it ever been a private collection? <laughs> Uh, I do not believe so. It was hidden away for a long period of time. But if you could, he made uh, many of these. If you had you know, several million dollars, you could probably buy one. What is the insurance valuation of it? Several million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, I am painting, or rather, I am, paint, I am painting pictures, he wrote, or rather, non-pictures. The time for pictures has gone. In 1916, he wrote to an art critic that I am constructing a new universe with the ashes of the earth. The earth has been destroyed. He is creating something new. And he had great ego, by the way. As an artist, that he could create something without war. Uh, and his colleague, Vladimir Tatlin, who was Al Tatlin, who was also very famous, did something slightly different, but also related, something that also existed purely as form, right? but was made with, uh, well, non-standard materials, right? So Tatlin, who was an easel painter, created sculptures called the called Corner Counter Reliefs. And I think this is a reconstruction of one. Maybe it's the original picture. It's not a original picture. It's a reconstruction, right? And when she basically took some boards and wire and um, went across the corner, right? And called it art. <laughs> And similar to Malevich, he was kind of in competition with Malevich. He, uh, Tuckman and his followers said, now we only create pure form with no content. Except he too, apparently, explained this work in re reference to the war in similar terms to say that his work countered the violence and the destructive effects of war by not depicting anything. Right? just by being. So these artists thought they found a way to avoid the trap right? that made modernity and realism mutually excuse exclusive because for them the, real, the reality was the actual physical reality of the art and not what it was supposed to show right? or supposed to depict. And so this art was uh, not something else, it just was itself, right? And later advocates claim that this new modern aesthetic was the only one that could form the basis for a new culture in the 20th century. And it became very, very influential both in the early Soviet Union, right? Uh, this kind of abstract modernism, although this is not an object of art anymore because it means something behind itself. Uh, but also, Vasily Kandinsky came back to Germany after, he was in Russia after the war, very much influenced by this, although he was not a part of this group. And through Germany and through the Soviet Union, this basic philosophy, or this basic aesthetic style, entered modern architecture, and much of the international style of modern architecture, uh, you could say, through the Bauhaus and other things, was related to 
you know, the black square, it's kind of a stretch, but uh, I think it's not that much of a stretch. Right? And later on, many of you um, American ex uh, abstract expressionists in the 1950s were doing many of the same things, right? But this was 50 years before that, and they were not aware of that. Later on, they became more aware of it and said, hey, well, I just thought of it, you know, much earlier than us. But the thing about uh, the war is that other people in other countries were doing similar things. Right? Mondrian in the Netherlands. Composition in blue, 1917. It's so much like Malevich that it's amazing to find out that the two had no contact. They were doing similar things completely separately. Right? But through the war experience, somehow coming to the same conclusions that simple geometric form and objectivity of the art somehow was the way to save humanity. And this painting and paintings like this by critics have, have been uh, understood as a type of art that could unify and heal a divided European culture during and after the Great War. And this became de steel in, uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s. And uh, also, I'll give you a question about Dada, which you may be familiar with. Also during the war, 1916 in uh, Switzerland, also 1917 in New York, right, where Marcel Duchamp took a urinal <laughs> and tried to get it into the international exhibition and got rejected, <laughs> calling it the fountain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this is, a, of course, hilarious, but it's also meant to show that, well, what is art after all? Art is just an object, right? And I, it's, I, the fountain, by the way, is an ironic title, right? So here you have objectivity, you have irony uh, emerging in the context of the war in Dada also separate from suprematism and Mondrian. People are living in the same time, coming to very similar conclusions in ways that I don't quite know how that works. But if I ever get around to it, I'll um, write a better book about it. Question back there. No? Question? The final thing I want to, the final uh, example I want to give to you is um, much more easier on your brains. Right? And that's Christopher Nevinson, uh, and also very famous English painter. Uh, so uh, Nevinson was a futurist and a cubist before the war. Uh, he joined the Quakers Ambulance Service in Belgium, so he was a direct witness. Right? Uh, and in those early years he did paintings. Uh, of his observations of the front lines and hospitals and so on that were very Cubist in style. Cubist influenced, right? You can see this painting, French Soldiers Resting in 1916. It has a very Cubist style, although it does have a narrative, right, of French soldiers resting. Uh, and uh, many people thought Cubism was actually a very good style for depicting war and World War I. Anybody want to know why? It's very stark. It can be very stark. His is very stark. And, the, and the, it's very few soft angles. Angular, right? Very metallic in this case. So through the form of this painting, he is suggesting some characteristics about World War I. The mechanism of World War I. It's so mechanical, right? And full of moving parts, right? Unemotional, I believe. Unemotional, there's a distance here. I think you're all on the right track that many people thought, and probably the artist himself thought. Oh, it's like making Legos. <laughs> well, it looks kind of like that, right? But when you think of World War I, do you think of like sheep in a bucolic field, or, you know, <laughs> rays of beautiful sunshine coming up, or quiet church in the background? No, you don't usually think about these things. Um, you think about, you know, this, um, which critics thought was one of the rare paintings to capture the suffering of modern warfare without flag waving and without drum beating, right? 
So, but also not necessarily a criticism. I don't, is this a criticism of the war? I think it would be hard to make the case that this is a criticism of the war. Does this support the war? By not criticizing, are you supporting? I don't know. The Cuba style is very detached, right? And unemotional. Here's a hospital. Are the people suffering? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. But the color and the composition suggest something very detached. You might say the artist is somewhat detached. Uh, and so Cubism was, uh, was seen as a poss possible way to capture the regimentation and the machine-like qualities right, of warfare, of this kind of warfare, which you've all pointed out. Uh, but this, his style changed. Again, his style also changed when he um, was recruited by the Department of Information the British Department of Information, which was uh, kind of the propaganda ministry, uh, and went and became an official artist, was sent to the front to paint the war officially. So they got a group of artists together and said, you guys go, this is like informally, you guys go to the, uh, to the front and paint the war. And what kind of war paintings do you think they expect from these official artists? Patriotic, supportive. Patriotic, supportive, Lively. realistic, but you know, show our gritty soldiers, right, and uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, kind of something like this, maybe, but not so angry. Uh, so he was there in 1917 in France and in Belgium, and he was the first avant-garde artist to join this program. He returned to London, where he produced 75 paintings, drawings, and prints on the war. One of which was called Paths of Glory. Now, you may have heard of the movie Paths of Glory, which you should go watch uh, right after this, <laughs> in about five minutes. Paths of Glory is actually a poem, right, an elegy that was written in the, 19, in the 1740s. Right? So it's 150 years old already by the time this Paths of Glory is created. Right? And the knife, the knife stands of uh, uh, this meditation on death and fate. I mean, Paths of Glory is not about you know, World War I. It's obviously much older than that. The ninth stanza contains the sentence, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. And what does that mean? The paths of glory lead but to the grave. Even if you're brave, even if you're strong and heroic, what is your end? Death. Death. What if you're a coward? What is the end? Death. death. On whichever side you're on, that's Whichever side you're on, death. That's what that movie, uh, Glory, that's the feeling it gave me at the end when we were burying the north and the south. Well, that's a good movie, too, and you should see that after Paths of Glory. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's not about World War One, but it's, you know, also it's civil war. significant yeah. and well-made. So if you compare this with soldiers resting, right, What's the difference? Very similar. What about the, just look at the color. What's the difference in color? This one's lighter. Well, what color is this? Earthy. This is an earth color. And is this a realistic color? No. What about the sky in the background? Sure, the French have blue uniforms, but they're, Color is much different. What's going on in this painting? Shows the devastation. Line. Yes, you can actually see what no man's land is like, right? And what is it like? It's destroyed. There's nothing there. And what about the people? They're destroyed. Uh, well, you can't tell. Well, I guess you can't tell. Uh, the barbed wire in the background. Right? Gives it a certain texture. Where's the texture like? And there's actually all sorts of little like uh, shreds of right. wire and stuff here. Prickly. It's kind of prickly. Right? Uh, it's sort of got a, a very uh, three dimensional character to it. This is very, you know, modern art is very flat, right? Cubism tends to be flat to open things up, right? This has got some depth to it and also the texture. 
And uh, so he's responded to the First World War in this painting by imagining, again, the reality of war. And for many of you, this represents the reality of war much better than the black square, which, as you know, represents what? <laughs> you all get an A. <laughs> you all get an A. But the question is, does this really depict a reality of war, the reality of war? Is it a reality of war, or is it not reality at all? Yes? Do you think you ever saw Matthew Brady's photographs from the Civil War? Because that's instantly what I thought of when I saw this. I don't know. He probably saw stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. Or photographs like this. About it, it just reminded me of yeah, I think, you know, yeah, I probably not. I, I would say he probably didn't see those particular photographs, but he may have seen photographs similar to that. That's really not about, about, about World War I. Not, the Civil War is not very well known outside of the U.S. Or it still isn't. Uh, what do you think the British government thought about this painting that they had officially commissioned? <laughs> <laughs> they did not allow it to be shown. <laughs> It was considered a hindrance to the war effort. <laughs> he actually, uh, so they would not let it be shown. But why? It shows the reality of war. Does it show the soldiers as being cowards? It don't want people to think of dying. They want them to think of Listen, how, can you really think that you're going to go to war and uh, it's not going to be like this? No, you don't understand that I have no idea what they do. All I know is that Nevinson, without telling him anybody, put on a one-man show with this painting, with a piece of brown paper diagonally across it, with uh, the word censored in big letters. <laughs> and then what did the press do? The press took pictures of it, ran headlines like, things we want to know. What is hidden by the paper? What is hidden by the path? We put it across the people. Right, so you couldn't see the bodies, you couldn't see the dead ones. And this was great publicity for the artists. Uh, and uh, they took down took down his painting. So we're not exactly sure why this painting um, was forbidden or why it was deemed to be unacceptable, but I think you probably all have get the hint on why the official version did not want this, the official powers did not want this out as a version of what the reality of war was. Uh, because Actually, speaking of photographs, in the newspaper you can see photographs that are much worse than this. Right? You can see photographs of people with their face blown off. Right? You can see dead bodies. Photo a photograph, why is a photograph different than a painting? That is a rhetorical question. Oh. But we're almost at the question session. So maybe you can just ask the question. A passion and emotion in a painting. I would say. Maybe. Many people react to a painting differently. Right, because why? So you can't argue with a photograph. Why not? Mm -hmm. You can argue with it. You should argue with photographs. <laughs> <laughs> photographs are lies. People think of photographs as reality when they think of a painting or something. Well, that's what people, yes, people do think of that. But you shouldn't, because photographs are lies also. They can be. No, they are. <laughs> you gotta be <laughs> no, I'll give you an A. <laughs> this is not the time to talk about photographs, but we can if you want. But uh, photographs, you can understand that, yes, people reading newspapers consider photographs to be something different. They consider that to be reality. And they consider painting to be something constructed by an artist to make a point. And so you can imagine that government officials and public people who are lay people would say, this person is trying to make a point about war and it's not good. <laughs> it's, even though he is saying, this is reality, right? And I'm just painting the reality, but because he's painting it, it's different than if he had taken just a photograph. And put the, if he had, this was a photograph, he could put it in the newspaper, right? But because of what it is, how it is created, where it is shown, it is considered to be subversive, even though the photograph and the, and the painting are depicting the same thing, right? And in 1917, the government purchased it. Uh -huh. And I'll end now. 
Why do they you think they cursed? You people are smart. You all get names. That's my presentation. Thank you very much.